Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Wednesday, April 20th, 2022. Russian President Vladimir Putin saying his country has conducted a first test launch of a new intercontinental ballistic missile with mock nuclear warheads that will, in Putin's words, make Russia's enemies think twice. As Russian military forces continue their assault in eastern and southern Ukraine and the Ukrainian military leader in the key strategic port city of Mariupol, warning it could be a matter of days or hours before they are overrun. In Washington, President Joe Biden meeting with top U.S. defense officials at the White House as he considers sending even more military aid to Ukraine. Two months into that war, why has the much-feared massive Russian cyber attacks on Ukraine and the U.S. not materialized? The White House National Cyber Director has asked that question today. We'll get the answer. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas in Panama discussing immigration policy. A question to him about whether Title 42, that regulation used to turn away migrants at the U.S.-Mexico border for health reasons based on the COVID-19 pandemic, will be repealed as scheduled in late May. And on this 420 semi-official marijuana holiday, we'll talk with a reporter from The Hill about legislation to legalize cannabis on the federal level. It's passed the U.S. House pending in the U.S. Senate. From Associated Press, Russian forces tightened the noose around diehard Ukrainian defenders holed up at a Mariupol steel plant Wednesday amid desperate new efforts to open an evacuation corridor for civilians trapped in the ruined city, keep battleground in Moscow's drive to seize the country's industrial east. With global tensions running high, Russia reported the first successful test launch of a new type of intercontinental ballistic missile. President Vladimir Putin boasting it can overcome any missile defense system and make those who threaten Russia think twice. Video of President Putin speaking to senior officials in Russia was released. Dear comrades, I congratulate you on the successful launch of the Sarmat intercontinental ballistic missile. This truly unique weapon will strengthen the combat potential of our armed forces, reliably ensure Russia's security from external threats, and will make think twice those who, in the heart of frenzied, aggressive rhetoric, try to threaten our country. Russian President Vladimir Putin on Russian state TV. At the White House in Washington, Press Secretary Jen Psaki asked about this missile launch and also about conversations to send another military aid package to Ukraine. On the, the long-range missile test today, Putin said this is uh, meant to provide food for thought for those who threaten Russia. Can you talk us through how the administration is interpreting this and whether you're viewing this as a, a warning or a threat in any way? Uh, we are not. They were they notified um, under uh, the START treaty. Um, and so uh, from our perspective, while we they provide advance notice of this launch under its new START treaty obligations that it planned to test this missile, the Defense Department said today that we did not deem the test a threat to the United States or its allies, and the timing and the scope of Russia's missile test do not influence our approach to countering Russia's further invasion of Ukraine. So it was noticed uh, through the proper process, and the Department of Defense has spoken to this as well. And on uh, an expected announcement of another round of assistance mm -hmm. to Ukraine, could you walk us through any specifics, if you have any, on that when that's happening? And, and just big picture on this, the U.S. has already given more than $2.5 billion since this war started. How long can the U.S. expect to continue to bankroll so much of this war? Well, um, okay, there's a couple questions there, so let me do my best in answering them. Um, first, um, we are working, uh, of course, around the clock, as you know, to provide security assistance to Ukraine. And just to give you an example of how uh, that assistance has flowed just in the last few days, and I think I gave an update the other day, but uh, five flights with military assistance have arrived in the region over the last few days. More than half a dozen flights from the United States are scheduled to land in the region shortly with additional equipment. And as we look at the providing this assistance, which I know I'll go back to your, the first part of your question, of course, but what we've tried to do, we made a strategic decision given we've seen Russia um, reposition uh, their troops and their military to the eastern part of Ukraine to fight a different kind of war on the ground, which will be more uh, you know, um, 
kind of uh, shooting back and forth through long range. And so we have been working with the Ukrainians and the Ukrainian military to determine exactly the kind of security assistance they need for this stage in the war. And that has included an increase, as you've seen, in artillery and ammunition and uh, weapons like howitzers and others that can do these sort of the can are effective in this long range shooting and long range fighting that we are seeing or we ex anticipate will happen in this stage of the war. So we have been uh, expediting this assistance uh, to the ground over the last couple of weeks to ensure they are prepared as this as this portion of the war is starting, not because they are using all of it in, in seven days, but because we want them to have all of this equipment as quickly as possible as they prepare to fight this war on the ground. Uh, in terms of assistance and what we would be, what we're preparing or the reports that I know have been out there, um, I will say I expect we'll have more soon on this, um, but I have nothing to preview at this point in time. I would note that out of the $3.5 billion in drawdown authority Congress granted for this fiscal year, we have used over $2.4 billion so far to provide Ukraine the military equipment and capabilities they need to defend themselves. So obviously there's more of that approved drawdown assistance that we can provide and we've been working to expedite and ensure, as I noted, it's meeting exactly the needs they have at this point in the war. At the White House press briefing, Press Secretary Jen Psaki with reporters. Later in the day, President Joe Biden in the White House cabinet room meeting with his Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, Deputy Secretary of Defense, Kathleen Hicks, also members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the combatant commanders president talking about the war in Ukraine. Today I want to hear from all of you on your assessments on what you're seeing in the field and across our forces. And the strategic environment is evolving rapidly in the world, but that means our plans and force posture have to be equally dynamic. Things are changing. And, uh, you know, ensuring that the security of the American people, our interest and the interests of our allies, uh, means having to uh, constantly adapt to anything and everything that's happening around the world. And uh, we're seeing this very day uh, the need for adapt adaptation as a consequence of uh, us standing with Ukraine against Putin's brutal and unjustified war. And, uh, and I want to applaud the exceptional work you're doing to arm and equip brave Ukrainians to defend their nation. I don't know about you, but I've been to Ukraine a number of times before the war. I've spoken to the Rada. I was deeply involved in what was going on in Ukraine. And I knew they were tough and proud. But I tell you what, they're tougher and more proud than I thought. I'm amazed what they're doing with your help in terms of providing advice and, uh, and, and the, the weaponry we're providing, along with the rest of NATO. Weapons and an ammunition are flowing in daily. And we're seeing just how vital our alliances and partnerships are around the world. Our allies are stepping up, amplifying the impact of our response, and NATO is united, focused, and energized as it's ever been. When I was a kid in the United States Senate in my 30s and into my 40s, I was uh, chairman of the NATO subcommittee, the Foreign Relations Committee. I, not because of me or any particular thing, but I've never seen NATO as united. And all the, I, I'm confident in my view, just this is Biden speaking, that uh, I don't think that uh, Putin counted on being able to hold us together. And I've spoken well over 150 times to uh, our NATO allies, either like yesterday or Fort. How many on? Twelve. How many? Twelve. Twelve. Uh, yesterday for a couple hours. Uh, they, uh, they are, um, they're, they're, they're stepping up. President Joe Biden meeting with his top defense officials, including the Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and the Deputy Defense Secretary Kathleen Hicks, plus members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the White House Cabinet Room. You can find his full remarks archived at our website, cspan.org. He did not answer any reporter's shouted questions. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees says the number of people who have fled Ukraine since the war began now over 5 million and the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres is sending a letter to Russia's U.N. delegation requesting a meeting with Russian President Putin in Moscow to discuss, quote, urgent steps to bring about peace in Ukraine and the future of multilateralism based on the Charter of the United Nations and international law. He sent a separate letter to the Ukraine mission at the U.N. asking for a meeting 
in Kyiv. Poland's ambassador to the United States discussing the war today. Poland borders Ukraine, particularly the intense fighting in eastern Ukraine, the area known as the Donbass, which contains territory recognized by Russia as breakaway independent countries, Donetsk and Luhansk. Marek Magaraski interviewed today by David Rubenstein, president of the Economic Club of Washington in Washington, D.C. Why do you think Putin is trying to do what he's doing? He wants to take over all of Ukraine and have it be a... He dreams of winning the Cold War, but not the new one. Sometimes we are talking about a new Cold War unfolding in front of our eyes in Europe. I think he dreams of winning the old Cold War, which uh, are, well, basically ended at the beginning of the 90s. It's like adding a new twist to a movie or rewriting the script altogether. This is his main ambition. How long do you think this war will go on at this point? It seems that it will be a protracted conflict. Now the Russians are regrouping and moving their units to the eastern part of Ukraine. The character of this war itself is changing as we speak because uh, from the very beginning as it has been a land war uh, in spite of the fact that one of the most spectacular events in that war was the sinking of the Moskva cruiser. Uh, but it has been a land war, and it will be uh, more of a long land war right now. Uh, um, clashes and battles of tanks. It's like, uh, you know, um, returning to, to the times of, the, of World War II. So uh, you think that this could go on for quite some time, but you think at some point Putin would like an off-ramp so he could say, I won, I got something. What is it you think he now thinks he needs to get to be able to say, he can end this. Is there something? Reasonable? No matter, no matter how this war ends, and uh, again, I'm I'm pretty optimistic, and I think that Ukraine will prevail, and the Russian army will be eventually crushed in Ukraine, uh, regardless of the final outcome of this uh, uh, conflict. Uh, Putin has to sell it as a victory, and we are approaching now the uh, a turning point, a crucial moment, which will be the the uh, May the ninth the victory parade on the Red Square in Moscow, and he will feel uh, obliged to sell uh, this military operation in Ukraine as um, a success, as a military achievement of the Russian Federation. I wonder how he will do it. Uh, Paradoxically, now with the Russians living mostly in an information bubble, because they have been, uh, well, essentially cut off from, uh, from... unbiased information and, uh, and uh, uh, objective media coverage, he, he can do it. He can sell this defeat in Ukraine. And I, uh, again, hopefully it will be a defeat for the Russian army and for, for the Russian, Russian Federation as victory. Marek Magaraski is Poland's ambassador to the United States, interviewed by David Rubenstein, president of the Economic Club of Washington. They were in Washington, D.C. at the JW Marriott Hotel. May 9th in Russia is a holiday, Victory Day, marking the Soviet Union's defeat of Nazi Germany in 1945 at the end of World War II. And it is a date that leaders of the Soviet Union and since the breakup of Russia have used to celebrate military strength with parades and ceremonies. Also talking about that date and how the fighting is going in Donbass, the eastern part of Ukraine. Philip Breedlove, a retired four-star U.S. Air Force general who was NATO Supreme Allied Commander 2013 through 16, he says the Ukrainian military has already proven it can fight and fight hard. It's about a 300-mile front. It's a twisty, windy front, but about a 300-mile front. In the midst of this, Of course, Mariupol still stands to a certain degree, but we're watching some really ugly things play out in Mariupol. And uh, I believe that our nation in the West needs to stand up and call an end to some of it. We see what uh, most um, uh, ground military thinkers would call shaping and probing going on to this point. No real major thrusts have started yet, but that is not necessarily good news. This actually may portend that they're going to be a little smarter here than they were in the north where they took a whipping. And so I think that uh, we should be watching clearly how this shaping and probing takes place to give us some idea of what could happen and where they might push through. 
So much is said about numbers. If you remember before the war, we were counting the tens of thousands of troops and number of battalion tactical groups, et cetera, et cetera. And, and uh, I think what we've learned so far is that those numbers are uh, informative, but they may not be demonstrative. And so uh, with that, it's, it's, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a little tepid to say that right now we see about 76 battalion task groups in the East we think that maybe 11, 12, or 13 of those are brand new that have been brought from other theaters to fight. I believe that we can safely say that the battalion task groups that were taken out of the fight in the north and repurposed to the east are probably not, not at full strength. Uh, and they may have some remaining problems from the losses that they took in the north. Um, things that uh, do not portend well for our Ukrainian brothers and sisters. We see a better emphasis, better meaning Russian, better emphasis on attack aviation, both fixed wing and rotary wing. And so uh, they look to try to solve their problems of a combined armed approach that they had in the north and were unable to affect, and that cost them dearly. We all understand that they have a new commander and that he has sort of task reorganized the, the forces and that he will be calling the shots on what I just spoke about. The probing and the shaping will tell him where to put his main effort as he tries to find weakness in the, the uh, Ukrainian forces. And we believe that uh, much has been said in the press, but we do believe that the terrain in the South lends itself better to Russian style fighting. So before we, before we declare that a big boon, let's remember, let's just remember how well the Ukrainian forces prepared in the North and let's give them credit for having thought this equally through. And so Russia will face a stiff resistance. Okay, so uh, as to the victory by May 9th, based on what I just said, which I think is really important, and that is that Ukraine has been preparing for this, and this is a military that's already demonstrated incredible imagination and an incredible resiliency, and I don't think this is going to be easy for Russia again. Russia may be able to bring mass, and that will make a difference, but I believe that Ukraine will be ready as they have been before. And I think it's, John, you asked me to go out on a limb. I think it's unlikely they're going to be able to declare a big victory by the ninth. They may take down Mariupol by the ninth, and that may be their big victory, but I don't believe that we'll see the kind of parade that Mr. Putin is counting on by the ninth. Retired General Philip Breedlove, former NATO Supreme Allied Commander Europe, now Atlantic Council Board Director, a virtual program today hosted by the Atlantic Council. From CNN, European Council President Charles Michel said that there were no words to explain what he feels after visiting Ukraine on Wednesday, adding that Russia must be punished for the events unfolding in the country. Speaking alongside Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky in Kiev, Michel said that earlier in the day he had visited the town of Borodyanka, which where mass graves full of hundreds of murdered civilians were discovered following the withdrawal of Russian forces from the Kyiv region. The U.S. government has been issuing warnings even before Russia's invasion of Ukraine about Russia's possible use of cyber attacks not only against Ukraine but on critical infrastructure in the U.S. or other Western countries. Deputy U.S. Attorney General Lisa Monaco telling 60 Minutes on CBS this past Sunday, we are seeing Russian state actors scanning, probing, looking for opportunities, looking for weaknesses in our systems on critical infrastructure on businesses. But will it happen? And why hasn't Russia used cyber as a weapon yet? Those questions today to the White House National Cyber Director Chris Inglis. He sat down with David Sanger, New York Times, White House and National Security Correspondent. We entered this figuring that any modern conflict would start with a major cyber attack at the beginning. 
that you know undersea cables would be cut or the power grids would be fried or the Russians would attack uh, enough of the internet structure within Ukraine that they could shut down all the communications. Um, and so along comes the first major kinetic war between nation states fought in the cyber age. And that's not what we saw. We did see some early action in January and February, but we didn't see the big, um, bigger attacks. I was at a symposium recently where a number of your uh, government colleagues were debating why that was. And you know, there are a couple of interesting theories around, but I'd be interested in first in just hearing yours. Well, first, David, thank you very much for the warm welcome. Thanks to Connor and the council for setting this up. And I think we've so longed to have these face-to-face -face discussions for the last two years. It's a delight to learn again how to speak in the presence of real people. <laughs> and I look forward to this discussion. Um, you know, the difficulty of the job, you know, for the next hour might be one thing, and the rest of the job might then pale in comparison. Um, but you've asked a great question. It's the question of the moment. Why, given that we had expectations that the Russian playbook, having relied so heavily on disinformation, cyber, married with all other instruments of power, why haven't we seen a very significant play of cyber, at least against NATO and the United States in, in this instance? Um, I, I can't say that I know with precision any more than anyone outside the Russians themselves might know, but I think we can deduce perhaps um, several things. Um, first and foremost, um, it's not playing out the way the Russians had imagined. Right, that they had imagined that their kinetic forces married with this information could overwhelm and take the country by storm within a matter of days, right, if not kind of sooner than that. Um, and therefore, they probably did not have an incentive to use um, a computer network attack in the way we might have imagined um, to achieve degrees of disruption or destruction of an infrastructure that they thought they would soon inherit. Uh, neither did they want to inflame um, kind of the NATO or the United States alliance um, with what might be an unnecessary provocation. So, so there's some degree of self-imposed deterrence on their part. Um, two, um, as soon as it was realized by them and others that it wasn't playing according to plan, um, they were distracted, they were busy, right? It, it's hard when you're on your back foot trying to recover your initiative um, to then mount a campaign of any sort. And we saw that play out certainly on the ground, and I think to some degree in cyberspace. Um, finally, it's harder to do than it is to kind of say um, that, that mounting a campaign of any sort, whether it's on the ground or in cyberspace, requires a certain understanding of what the lay of the land is, a certain ability to then understand what the lay of the land of your victims, your targets might be, and an ability to not simply fire salvos, um, but, but to do that with some continuous understanding of what that lay of the land is, such that you can then mount and effect a campaign. And if you're up against a heterogeneous architecture, which clearly that, that's what exists in cyberspace, again, it, it might not be that it's easy to do. The last thing I would observe is that all of that imagines that cyber is not an independent domain. It's not something that sits off to the side where cyber on cyber plays out all day, every day. It's connected necessarily to the real world. And so the aspirations of the Russians and the defense mounted by the Ukrainians is strongly connected um, between cyber and the physical world. And therefore, the stout hearts that we see on one side, the confusion we see on the other, the use of this as an instrument of power as opposed to something that plays out in independent domain it is something where there's a pun intended strong analog between the physical world and the cyber world. So think out for the weeks ahead. So uh, Putin has now narrowed his objectives in the physical world, right? He's down in the southeast. Uh, he's withdrawn his forces, at least for now, from going after Kyiv. Um, as you look out ahead at this integrated set of battles, are you expecting that inside Ukraine we are going to see more use of cyber? And at what point do you think, if at all, he then turns to attacking targets in the West to retaliate for the sanctions, for the isolation, and so forth? I don't know the Let me take those in reverse order. I don't know the answer to that second question, which is at what point would we expect or do I predict that we'll see um, the Russians attack the West, NATO, or the United States? Right, that's, that's a fraught decision that has dire consequences on both sides. And I don't know that that decision has either been made or that it's eminently predictable with precision we might prefer. But I would say that we have strategic warning of the possibility, and, and we therefore need to prepare for that possibility. Um, having that strategic warning, we then need to, to figure out how do we actually understand 
as it's happening um, at the earliest possible moment, what's happening, when, why, so that we can deal with that. That's what essentially guides our present efforts, which is having strategic warning in hand. How do we affect a collaboration, not just between nations, but between the private sector and the public sector, to combine our insights, our assets, our capabilities, so that if one of us sees something that might not be plainly visible to another, or better, if one of us sees a bit of it, but not all of it, and can't perhaps put that in the proper context, we compare and contrast so that we could discover things together no one can discover alone. That's, I think, the game before us, is how do we actually put ourselves in the front balls of our feet to anticipate and, and to react to that. Um, having said that, um, I think that we're in a reasonably good place. Um, the architectures, which we know as the Internet or Cyberspace Plus, have not been built for 40 years to be as resilient and robust as we might prefer. But, but we've done a lot in the last few years to essentially install the mechanisms in there. Um, we now have a collective understanding that these instruments of power are useful not just for their own sake. Cyber doesn't exist for its own sake, but for broader societal purposes. And I think you have most people, individuals, organizations, governments, leaning forward in the straps trying to figure out what they can do to make it defensible and to actually defend it. That being said, um, we're still open for um, a sucker punch, not Petya, for many of you remembering from 2017, affected a broad population that were not in the intended victim set. That was the Russians going after the Ukrainians, um, and it escaped its, its moorings and essentially ripped across Europe and brought other swaths within the, uh, the world um, and affected a, a great physical harm and also some confidence, some kind of attacks on confidence about the underlying nature of that architecture. So if I worry about one thing going forward, and we need to actually put action to this worry, um, it's that we will be comfortable that the last few weeks predict the next few weeks doesn't necessarily. Um, and that we'll be comfortable that we can defend ourselves, you know, fairly and fully because we have a resilient architecture that's well defended. We should not make the mistake of kind of understanding that our present circumstance is still one where kind of an adversary might then seize the initiative and come at us. And we need to make it such that they have to beat all of us to beat one of us. I think that's where we need to be. Chris English is the current and first ever White House National Cyber Director, interviewed by David Sanger of The New York Times, a White House national security correspondent an event today hosted by the Council on Foreign Relations. NATO's Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence is in the middle of its annual cyber war game exercise. It's named Lock Shields. Securityweek.com describes it as it takes place in Estonia's capital and it'll run until April 22nd with more than 2,000 participants from over 32 countries. And they go on, this year's scenario involves... Burl, Berlia, a fictional island country in the northern Atlantic Ocean, victim of a series of crippling coordinated cyber attacks that disrupted the operation of government and military networks, communications, electric power grid, and water purification systems. From the Army Times, the Army has picked Sig Sauer to build and deliver its next-generation squad weapon variants. The weapon takes 6.8-millimeter cartridges and will come in both rifle and automatic rifle variants. Sig Sauer won a 10-year contract with an initial delivery order worth $20.4 million. There was a Pentagon briefing about this today. You're going to hear a reporter's question to Colonel Scott Medore, Brigadier General Larry Burris, and Brigadier General William Boroff. I was wondering if you could sort of talk about, you know, what it what excites you about what the new weapon does that the old one didn't, and then as the follow up, what what are you hearing from soldiers as they were testing these that they really like about it? So, so, go ahead. so, so, I, go ahead. so I'll speak first, I guess, sir. Um, so the, I mean, the, the capability increase that these weapons provide over the M4 and the and the M249 is what's really exciting. It's it's a significant change the way it fires, the way uh, when when it, when you apply the uh, fire control, which was previously awarded back in January, when you apply that to these weapon systems, uh, it re it improves um, or increases the probability of hit for the individual soldier, reduces aim error. Um, and it's, it's, it's a game changer. So that's really what excites me uh, about the, these two systems as we saw them go through uh, testing. Yeah, hey, this, this is Larry Burris. If I could add on to that, I mean, in addition to the accuracy provided by the next generation fire control system, what you also have is much greater energy at the target, whether it's protected or unprotected at various ranges. And so 
it's a it's a um, there's much greater energy on the target. And from the ammunition side, it's uh, it's exciting for us because, as I said in my opening comments, the 5.56 we've uh, we've had great success with enhanced performance round, uh, but we've kind of maxed out that capability in the 5.56. So this will give us with overpressures, we'll be able to adjust the ammo. And, and give more opportunities as we build ammo projectiles out in the future. So it, it gives us more capability to enhance the weapon in the future where we had kind of maxed out on a 5.56. So from the ammunition perspective, it's very exciting. And in terms of, if I could go, this is Larry Burris again. If I could talk about soldier feedback, I mean, soldier feedback was provided, to, you know, based upon each weapon prototype that was provided by the vendors. And so as a soldier received a weapon from a vendor, they would provide feedback on that particular um, weapon system. It was not compared against other weapon systems. It was here, here's a rifle from a vendor. Let's go shoot it, provide feedback, and that's what was provided back to the PEO and then to the vendors on the individual weapon systems. And that's how the soldier t feedback was done. And so it wasn't a comparison. It wasn't a comparison from one vendor to another or an M4 to another weapon system. It was here's a rifle, go shoot it. Officers in the Pentagon briefing room Brigadier General Larry Burris, Brigadier General William Boroff, and Colonel Scott Madour. More from the Army Times article, the decision to pursue an intermediate caliber round came out of the small arms ammunition configuration study, which emerged from concerns about body armor improvements among Russian and potentially Chinese troops. And the article continues over a 27-month period prototyping and testing period, hundreds of soldiers, Marines, and Special Operations Forces tested and evaluated the rifle and automatic rifle prototypes. And they also note in 2017, Six Hour also won the contract to provide the M17 and M18 handguns for the Army, replacing the Beretta M9 after three decades of service. Washington Today continues in a minute. Listen to C-SPAN Radio with our free mobile app, C-SPAN Now. Get complete access to what's happening in Washington, wherever you are, with live streams of floor proceedings and hearings from the U.S. Congress, White House events, the courts, campaigns, and more, plus analysis of the world of politics with our informative podcasts. C-SPAN Now is available at the Apple Store and Google Play. Download it for free today. C-SPAN Now, your front row seat to Washington, anytime, anywhere. And welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the free C-SPAN Now mobile video app and wherever you get your podcasts. From Reuters, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken on Wednesday called for more regional cooperation to help communities strained by inflows of refugees and migrants as he sought to rally Western Hemisphere nations to tackle record migration. Addressing foreign ministers from more than 20 nations on Wednesday at a hotel outside of Panama City, Panama, Blinken said more people were on the move, forcibly displaced from their homes than at any time since World War II. Secretary Blinken joined on this trip by U.S. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, and they all held a joint news conference in Panama City with their Panamanian counterparts. One reporter asking Mayorkas about U.S. strategy to deal with an increase in migrants on the U.S.-Mexico border. En concreto, ¿cuáles son la política que emprenderá ahora los Estados Unidos para cooperar un tema migratorio toda vez que tackle migration as countries of origin where this problem originates has not been present? We haven't had Venezuela, Cuba, and Haiti, for example, have not been present at this meeting. So our our um, our plans um, have a number of different components to them. Uh, one uh, critical first step is um, reflected in the ministerial that we have convened uh, today that has brought together so many different uh, nations. And that is to address uh, the root causes of why individuals flee their homes, leave their countries of origin for lands that are unfamiliar to them, the process of stabilization. Secondly, to build um, legal orderly and humane pathways so individuals do not need to place their lives, their well-beings, the well-beings of their loved ones in the hands of smugglers and traffickers who only seek to exploit them for profit. Third is to develop uh, humanitarian programs 
for individuals already resident in the countries other than those of their origin so that we can settle them in a stable and prosperous manner, address their needs, present them with the opportunities of a stable life in their new homes. Lastly, of course, in the United States, we have uh, significant humanitarian programs, uh, the asylum program, but we also take pride in being not only a nation of immigrants, but a nation of laws. Those who qualify for relief under our nation's laws will be provided a home in the United States and an ability to resettle in the, in the States. Those who do not qualify will be repatriated to their countries of or origin. And so to give integrity to our system and to stand as a, as a nation of laws as well as a nation of relief. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas at a news conference today in Panama. Foxnews.com has this. Several Democrats are voicing opposition to the Biden administration's plan to rescind Title 42 next month, warning of dire consequences should the health policy be removed with no plan in place to control the massive influx of migrants arriving at America's southern border. The policy used since March 2020 under both Presidents Trump and Biden provided the ability for American officials to bar migrants from entering the country during a health crisis such as the COVID-19 pandemic. The article at the Fox News site citing Ohio Democratic Congressman Tim Ryan, who's running for Senate, telling them that the removal of Title 42 is wrong and reckless and warning repercussions about safety of Americans. Back to Panama, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas asked if the repeal will happen as scheduled. Title 42, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, announced uh, uh, a while ago now uh, that the use of Title 42, which is a public health authority and not an immigration policy, uh, will discontinue as of May 23rd. And we are in the Department of Homeland Security and throughout uh, the government uh, planning accordingly. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas in Panama, an official trip along with Secretary of State Antony Blinken. Daily Caller has an article. House Judiciary Committee Ranking Member Jim Jordan asked Alejandro Mayorkas to come prepared to testify to members of Congress with answers to five demands regarding certain immigration and border enforcement data. Jordan tweeting the letter to Mayorkas and adding this, Secretary Mayorkas likes to dodge answers to tough questions, so we're literally giving him the topics that we'll ask about at next week's Judiciary Committee hearing. No excuses. Of course, C-SPAN will be covering that hearing. CBS News in San Francisco reporting for the first time since the pandemic began, thousands gathering at San Francisco Golden Gate Park's Hippie Hill for 420, an annual celebration of all things cannabis. And to keep everyone safe, on-site cannabis sales will be allowed for the first time in the annual event's history. They also note that no one under 21 will be let in. National Conference of State Legislatures says that 18 states plus the District of Columbia have legalized the adult use of marijuana, but it's still illegal at the federal level. Democratic Senate candidate in Indiana, Thomas McDermott, releasing a campaign ad today in which he smokes marijuana on the screen. He's doing it, by the way, in Illinois, right near the Indiana border, and he calls for federal legalization. He's joined in this ad by attorneys, a city councilman, a distiller, and a physician also expressing support for legalization. It runs about a minute and a half. The legalization of cannabis is important to this campaign. My whole adult life, I've been surrounded by people, successful, creative people who smoke weed and who are dying for this to happen. We're ecstatic that it's happened in Illinois and in Michigan so that we can buy it legally. But why not Indiana? 37 states and four territories, inclusive of Washington, D.C., have medical marijuana. Prior to the Roman Empire, they talked about marijuana being used as a joint-related re relief medicine. And veterans deserve this. Some of the people I serve with use it medicinally for anxiety and PTSD-related issues. Thousands of people I've represented had possession of marijuana charges, messed up their their housing, their ability to get jobs. They lose out on mortgages. People lost jobs for getting arrested. That's not right. We need to do better. By legalizing cannabis, you're able to not only benefit the consumer, but the producer now, right? Now we have farms in Illinois. 
where cannabis is being grown. The economic impact that it makes is tremendous. You know, not only for the state, but for smaller towns as well. You know, I get what you guys are saying, but being in an elected position now, I feel like our responsibility to uh, be part of this conversation. And Mayor, in the 20 years that I've known you, you've always said that someone's got to start the tough conversations, and I know you're the guy that always does. Here's the bottom line. We need to legalize marijuana on the federal level. We need to also legalize cannabis in Indiana as well, so the Hoosiers could get the health and economic benefits of cannabis. That's the future we all deserve. More on federal marijuana legalization efforts. We're joined on the phone by Aris Foley, who covers budget and appropriations and economic inequality issues for The Hill. Thanks for being with us. The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer tweeted today, support for cannabis legalization is at record levels. As we move forward, the Senate is working to end the federal prohibition on cannabis and ensure those impacted by the failed war on drugs are made whole. Hashtag 420 day. Well, a bill did pass the House. Where do things stand in the Senate? Right. That's, that's what, I think that's the million-dollar question that everyone's trying to, to figure out. I mean, right now we, we've seen Schumer and a few other Democrats like Booker and, and Wyden kind of build momentum for, for their uh, legalization bill, the Cannabis Administration and, and Opportunity Act. And it would remove cannabis from the federal list of controlled substances uh, includes criminal justice reform and tax and, and regulation provisions. And uh, honestly, I mean, a lot of advocates have really regarded it as this kind of major comprehensive reform bill from plans that we know of so far that, you know, it goes even further than the marijuana legalization bill that was passed by the House. But, I mean, one of the biggest hurdles that we're seeing so far is that the bill just hasn't been brought up yet. You know, there hasn't been an unveiling. Schumer said weeks back that senators behind the effort wanted to bring forward a, a comprehensive reform bill later this month. We saw some reports, you know, that some were hoping for a 420 unveiling uh, in a nod to more marijuana enthusiasts. But uh, no, he and other Democrats say that they're on track to introduce legislation before recess now in August. So it's kind of putting certain things up in the air. Anything they introduce, and this might be one of the reasons for the holdup, is it would need to get 60 votes, and that means, at the moment, getting about 10 Republicans. Any Republicans showing any interest in this? Right. So, as you're saying, yeah, there there has been mainly GOP opposition to the bill. Um, I there has been there has been some appetite among Republicans for for certain bills, like something more along the lines of the safe the Safe Banking Act, and that's something what, that would enable operating cannabis firms to, to use banking services. But a lot of leaders have kind of, you know, said they really haven't seen much support in their ranks for this type of legislation. So it really kind of dims the chances of them getting the 60 votes. I know that Schumer has said that he's talking to Republicans. Wyden has said he's talking to Republicans. I haven't heard back whether Republicans have been open to legalization. I mean, we've seen even some Republicans in states that have legalized, like Senator Steve Daines in Montana, that they want to support legalization. So this still seem to be a really party line issue. But honestly, to be frank, I mean, Schumer also kind of faces some challenges in unifying Democrats on a back board on legalization, just because you have members like Senator Manchin and, and Shaheen that are kind of still continuing to express reservations about recreational marijuana. As about uh, half the country, well, half the states or so, uh, legalizing marijuana in some form, the other half not, and it's still illegal on the federal level, what kind of uh, problems have been reported uh, with that contradiction? Right. Well, I mean, we do still see kind of an invited divide, I think, in, in between Congress and, and the public in some way. I mean, there has been growing support that's undeniable in polls for legalization. I think last year Gallup did a poll in November that found about half of Republicans back legalization. And we've seen 83% of Democrats back it. We've seen a huge amount of independents still be in line with it. So it does seem that some Republicans, even in states, again, that have legalized are out of step with voters. But I mean, they're, they're just a host of issues that I think senators have to, on both sides, kind of get 
to, to hash through in order to even find a path forward when it comes to passing something as comprehensive as, as this type of legislation. So if you had to guess, do you think something passes this year? You know, it would be exciting, right, I guess, for a lot of people who are really looking at this legislation to see the bill get introduced in the Senate, to see how fast lawmakers could act on the bill. But that's if they act on the legislation this year. I mean, there's a much smaller window between August, if they, introduce, they, if they do introduce the bill then, and midterm elections when it comes to legislative time. And then we have the new session of Congress that will be coming in months later that could look a lot different. I mean, it could play out that despite expected GOP opposition, the bill could serve as a great chance for some Democrats to show where they stand on such a popular issue in the upper chamber ahead of midterms. But, I mean, that could also just depend on how many Democrats are are voting to pass the legislation to begin with. Eris Foley is a reporter for The Hill. Find her stories at thehill.com and on Twitter at Eris Foley. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for having me, and and happy 420. (laughs) And marijuana legalization also coming up at today's White House briefing with Press Secretary Jen Psaki. President Biden as a candidate uh, promised to decriminalize marijuana. When is that going to happen? Well, the president uh, continues to believe that no one should be in jail uh, because of drug use. Uh, I don't have an update Here, uh, we are continuing to work with Congress, but what I can say on marijuana is we've made some progress um, on our promises. For instance, the DEA just issued its first licenses to companies to cultivate marijuana for research purposes after years of delay during the prior administration. This is a key step in promoting research because it broadens the amount and quality of cannabis available for research purposes. Additionally, the President is continuing to view his clem- review his clemency powers, which is something he also talked about on the campaign and is certainly remains committed to taking action on. So he remains committed to what he said during the campaign that uh, people charged with marijuana-related offenses, number one, everybody gets out, record expunged. Well, again, he's reviewing his clemency powers. That's exactly what that looks like. Um, I don't have any updates or previews beyond that. The White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki. One story, by the way, about why April 20th or 420 is a marijuana-focused holiday, not officially. It comes perhaps from a group of high school students in California in the 1970s meeting every day, they say, at 4.20 p.m. to smoke pot. But that's just one theory. White House Correspondents Association confirming today that President Joe Biden and First Lady Jill Biden will attend their organization's annual dinner on April 30th, the first time that the President and First Lady will be at this event since Barack and Michelle Obama attended in 2016. That's because Donald and Melania Trump did not go to any during the Trump presidency and the dinner was canceled in 2020 and 2021 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The headliner this year at the White House Correspondents Association dinner, Trevor Noah, host of The Daily Show on Comedy Central. Wall Street today, the Dow up 249, S&P down 2, NASDAQ down 166. CNBC has the headline, Dow jumps 249 points on Wednesday, but the NASDAQ is dragged down by a big plunge in Netflix. The article says Netflix fell 35 percent after its quarterly results showed a loss of 200,000 subscribers in the first quarter, its first reported subscriber loss in more than 10 years. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Get more top Washington stories sent to you every day by subscribing to C-SPAN's evening newsletter word for word. Sign up at c-span.org forward slash connect. Have a good night.